So following our initial look at memory, let's go and dive into the 60 SRAM bit cell, which makes up pretty much all of memory that's on chip today. So this is a basic static memory element, and actually uh, it might be surprising, but we saw this last lecture when we discussed flip-flops. Okay, so what we have here is a pair of cross-coupled inverters, and this is actually a really um, ingenious idea. Cross-coupled means that this inverter, it drives an output that is then driven back to the input of another inverter. And the nice thing here is that if we have a zero, say, on the input to this uh, inverter, what we get is a one at the output to this inverter, and that is propagated uh, as a one to the input of this inverter. The output of that is a zero, and as you can see, we get um, <coughs> a zero on both sides. That's a, a bistable element. It's really uh, kind of a cool thing because depending on what we do, we always have this uh, stable situation where we either have a zero and a one over here, or we could have a one and a zero over here, and it will be stable and static in, in that type of a position. Um, we usually call the internal nodes Q and Q bar, okay, it could be QB or Q naught or all kinds of things like that, and we usually say that the element, the storage element is holding a one according to um, uh, what the state is in Q. So if we have a one over here, we would call that a one, Okay, and if we have a zero in on this side, we would call it a zero. But that's also just a, a thing of um, giving it a name. In the end, this would be VDD, and this would be ground, and uh, we just have to somehow read that out of the cell and decide on what it is and be able to write into it. So that's our basic static uh, memory element. And let's see why this works so well. Well, it's by using positive feedback, which provides us with by stability. So um, again, what we have there is this back-to-back uh, uh, -back type of a, uh, a structure, as we can see here, right? And if we look at this, this is essentially in, uh, an infinite number of inverters that are um, chained to each other. So we could turn that into an inverter that's driving another inverter that, again, it, it keeps on going into infinity, right? So there are this infinite number of inverters. Um, and again, we have here like this uh, input over here of this guy is, and this is the output of this guy, but it's the input of this guy and the output of this guy. So for the first inverter, this would be like um, V in of the first inverter, and this is V out of the first inverter. Okay, but this will be then V in of the second inverter, and this will be V out of the second inverter. And this will be V in of the third inverter, and this will be V out of the third inverter, etc., etc. Well, Let's look at this. What happens if we draw um, a VTC of this, a voltage transfer curve? Okay, so we have a voltage transfer curve of, let's say, the first inverter. So we take this being V in A and this being V out A. And we uh, learned a lot that this is a voltage transfer curve. And we get this nice type of a um, VTC for that. Okay, but um, let's change colors over here and see what happens if, uh, for example, we look at V in B and V out B. So V out A is V in B. So this is also V in B. And v, uh, let's say that if this is the input, then this will be the output. So this will be V out B. And if we look, if we kind of turn our head around and look at this thing, what we get is that um, uh, we started with, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, V in being low, V out being high, so that was over here, and we ended up with V in being high and V out being low, that's over here, and what we actually get is a drawing like this, okay? And again, um, if I go and I change my color a second over here, and I have my red now, and say this is V out B is V in C, and V out C is the next, is the output of that guy, so V out B, which was over here, is also V in C, and V uh, out C is over here. And that is the same as this inverter. It's actually the same inverter, right? So every um, two are the same inverter. So again, we get this um, VTC. And something that we saw in, a, in an early electronic engineering course or something is we have so what we call an operating point, a stable point. And a stable point, when we look at a static curve, is where um, two uh, static graphs actually cross each other. So we see that in this case, we have one, two, three points where they cross each other, these two graphs. So all of these are static or stable states of this type of a circuit setup, okay? So wouldn't you call it then not by stability but tri-stability? And the answer is no. Actually, this is what we call a metastable point. 
and these two are the bistable points. So um, just let's say that this was Q and this was Q bar, okay, um, or QB we could call it. So if this is Q and this is QB, we said that uh, the V in A is going to be uh, Q, right, and V out A is going to be uh, Q bar. So this is the Q and this is Q bar, okay. Um, when Q is 1 and QB is 0, this would be a 1 state. And this one, uh, that's this, and this one would be when Q is 0 and QB is high, that would be a 0 state. Why is this metastable? Well, this thing um, is very much what you would uh, say is similar to a uh, hill. Okay, so let's say we have a hill over here like that, and uh, we came and we put a ball on the top of the hill. Well, um, obviously, if we put the ball over here, it's going to roll down and finally end up in this state, which we can call the zero state. And if we put the ball over here, it's going to roll down and end up in this state, which we can call the one state. And it doesn't matter where we put the ball initially, it will always roll down. What happens if we put the ball exactly on the middle of the hill? Well, it will stay there. But if there's any little tiny gust of wind that pushes it to the right, it's going to fall that way. If somebody comes and touches the ball to the left, it's going to fall down that way. So that's not really a, a good stable state. It's only a theoretical stable state. It will stay there for a limited amount of time, but then it will fall down. Um, can we see how this type of a thing works? Yes, we can look at the VTCs and see how this works. So I'm going to go back to my purple to show you um, how uh, we have the first stage working. So remember that a, an inverter is a very good amplifier. It, it tries to take a, a, a weak signal and make it strong. So let's take some sort of a weak signal. Let's say, for example, that our V in was somewhere near the like uh, middle point. It's still lower, let's say, than the V in low part. So it, we, we, we wanted to put a zero in here. So let's say this is V in A. Okay, but when we go and we look at where it comes out on our VTC, we're going to come out over here, and this is going to be V out A. Remember that V out A now, if we go into our, our green again, right over here, is going to be V in B. So this is the input now, this is V in B, right? It's going to be the input to our second inverter. And look where the VTC of our second inverter is over here. So it goes over here, and this is the output already. So this is going to be V out B. And we see that really quickly, we came into a strong zero state. And of course, we're going to continue there being strong. So um, this type of a, of a uh, structure, it very quickly amplifies the uh, zero or one state and brings our ball over here down to the zero state or the one state. Yes, if somehow we would start over here right in the middle, we would get stuck over here. You see, there is this metastable point here. But it's only a theoretical metastable point. Any type of uh, small deviance from this point will already throw us very quickly into one of our strong zero or one states. And so this is theoretical, but it won't stay there for very long. Anyway, so that is why a, an SRAM bit cell, which again was also used for the core of our flip-flop, is a bi-stability um, uh, structure, and it means that we can either be stable at a 1 or at a 0. It gives us nice noise margins, and uh, usually we won't get to this metastability state, and we for sure won't stay there for long. So, um, how do we write into one of these cross-coupled pairs? And the answer is that the right, right operation is ratioed. So we have our core of our bit cell here that has Q and Q bar. Um, let's add a switch over here to on the, on the left side, an NMOS switch. And we'll give it an enable, and therefore we can take our input over here, which we'll call D, right? And we can over, and we can just drive it onto Q and change the state from zero to one or one to zero, etc. Well, let's see. Does that actually work? Um, let's see. So again, this is our first option that we had an NMOS write transistor. So we have our uh, cross-coupled pair over here, and we brought in our NMOS write transistor. Okay, and we put VDD over here. To write, and if we put a zero over here on, uh, 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 well, well, we had a one over here. That's really good. Why? Because uh, an NMOS is really good at writing uh, zero. So we're going to be able to discharge this thing. We discharge it. This is going to go down to zero. It's going to flip that to one, and life is good. The problem happens that when we go to the one state, remember that driving a one when over here was initially a zero is not going to be good. Remember, we get VDD over VT here. The VGS is really uh, weak. It's really hard to drive um, a 1 through an NMOS. Remember, we have over here this 
PMOS on this transistor, which has now a zero, is um, trying to drive this node to one. Uh, 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 excuse me, I made a mistake over there. We have an NMOS on this transistor. We have an NMOS over here that is has a one on this side, and it's trying to hold this at zero. And we have to overcome the strength of this NMOS. Again, it was okay to overcome the strength of the PMOS with the NMOS over here to make a zero, but to overcome the strength of the NMOS with the P, uh, with, an, with this other NMOS is going to be really hard because this NMOS drives zero much stronger than this uh, NMOS drives one. So that's not a really good um, uh, option, and it's going to probably fail. It passes a weak one, and it's bad at pulling up against the feedback. Well, we can uh, uh, take option two, which is now going to just be changing it to a PMOS transistor. Okay, so let's change this guy and use a PMOS transistor instead. And then we will solve this problem of driving a one. We have again our um, NMOS that's pulling down to zero over here. It has a one over here and it's pulling this thing to zero. And um, this PMOS will probably be able to overcome it if it's a strong enough PMOS and we'll be able to write a one um, robustly into the cell over here. But again, we have the same problem over here that once we would want to write a zero. Okay, and uh, and this was being held by a strong PMOS at um, at one. We're going to have a hard time um, uh, driving through the PMOS down to zero. Okay, so again, we're going to have this uh, weak zero, and it's bad at pulling down against the feedback. Well, what else could we do? We could put a transmission gate. Hmm. Let's see if that'll work. So again, we have our cross-coupled pair over here, right? And instead of uh, Instead of an NMOS and a PMOS, instead of either an NMOS or a PMOS, we'll have a transmission gate, right, that'll have both an NMOS and a PMOS. And actually, that works pretty well, because we'll be able to both uh, pull down a zero here and push in a one over here, and probably overcome the feedback that's driven by this, um, this uh, inverter, as long as we have really strong gates over here and are able to, uh, uh, strong uh, uh, transistors over here that are over to do it. However, the question is, how do we read from the cell? And that's a, a good question. And the solution comes out to be what we call a differential NMOS write. So we take our cross-coupled inverter, and what we do is we put an NMOS on one side, and this NMOS is really good at writing a zero to this side. And we put an NMOS on the other side, and this NMOS is good at writing a zero to the other side. And by this symmetric type of a situation, we can either, again, drive this to zero or drive this to zero, which gives us the uh, option of driving a zero or a one into the cell. And we'll see in a second how we can read through this type of a structure. So that is our um, 6T NMOS cell. And again, so what we have here now is we have this cross couple inverter pair. Okay, and we have two NMOS transistors, one on each side. Okay, we will call this guy a word line and this guy a word line. They're going to be controlled by the same signal. And here we will have what we call a bit line, bit line and a bit line bar, bit line bar or bit line uh, with a, you know, a line on top. Okay, and the way we're going to actually read from this is, let's say conceptually, and this is just conceptual, let's say we have a zero over here and VDD over here. And again, it's completely symmetric. As you can see, the cell is completely symmetric, so it could be exactly opposite. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we can see that this is going to be a real long line with some sort of a parasitic capacitance. Okay, and what we're going to do is we're going to um, first pre-charge this capacitance. So we're going to stick lots and lots of charge in here and bring this up to VDD, both of them. We're going to pre-charge them up to VDD. So that's a pre-charge operation. Okay, but then we're going to float these guys. So nothing's holding them at VDD. Okay, and now what we're going to do is we're going to raise our word lines. Okay, and what's going to happen inside the cell? Well, look at this side. Here we have VDD and here we have VDD. There's actually VDS over here equals zero. And if you remember, we have our, like, for example, VDS versus ID. Um, when we're down over here at zero, the, 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 um, current is zero. So nothing's going to change, right? We have this resistor or whatever it is with uh, no um, uh, voltage swing. And this is going to stay at VDD. And this is going to stay at VDD. And there's no change over here. What about this side? Well, on this side, um, we have a, a, v, a VDS equals VDD. VDS equals VDD, right? That means we're going to have some 
uh, current that's going to go into here. Okay. So what's going to happen here is that current's going to flow from here to here. That means that these little um, charges over here are going to little by little go out. And that means that this is going to go down. So very quickly, we're going to get um, some sort of VDD minus delta V over here. Okay. Um, it's also going to cause this to go up a bit. So this is going to go up to delta V. Okay. But what we're going to do is we're going to take this bit line and this bit line bar, stick them in some sort of comparator, which we're going to call a sense amplifier. And we're going to find out that the left side over here is lower than the right side over here. And that means that this node is going to be zero and it's going to output that that's a zero. Okay. So again, what we're doing is a dynamic operation. Okay. If we take uh, some waveforms over here, what we're going to do is during the pre-charge phase, okay, we are going to uh, have, um, let's say, let's say that this will be bit line and this will be bit line bar. Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to charge them both up to whatever they were to VDD. This is VDD. This is VDD. So this and this are going to both be charged up to VDD throughout the, uh, the pre-charge phase. And then over here, we're going to go into the, um, uh, so here's uh, the word line, word line, okay? So over here, the word line is going to rise, okay? And after rising, we're going to go into the evaluation phase. And during the evaluation phase, in this case, um, the bit line bar, this guy, is going to just stay at VDD. But on the other hand, if this was VDD, this is going to start discharging. Okay, and then the sense amplifier, which would be over here, would be uh, maybe at some sort of a median phase uh, throughout the pre-charge. And over here somewhere, it's going to realize that there's a voltage difference between this guy and this guy. And it's going to go and it's going to lower down to zero. And that means that the output is zero. So that's how we're going to read from the 60S RAM cell. So if we look at the entire thing, this is our 60S RAM. I'm going to use these this numbering scheme. So the left side inverter over here is M1 and M3, um, with the access transistor being M2. The right side inverter over here is going to be M4 and M6, with the access transistor being M5. We're going to give these names. This is going to be a pull-down transistor. Pull-down. This is going to be a pull-down transistor. So the N MOSFETs are pull-down transistors. This is going to be a pull-up transistor. This is going to be a pull-up transistor. And they're PMOSs, so this is just a regular old inverter. Okay, and these are going to be the access transistors. This guy and this guy. And again, this is going to be bit line, this is going to be bit line bar. I'm going to always draw it hopefully like that, that left side is bit line, right side is bit line bar. Bit line is connected to the Q node, bit line bar is connected to the QB node. So um, if here is zero and here is VDD, we're going to call that a zero. And if uh, here is uh, VDD and here is zero, we're going to call that a one, but it doesn't really matter. Everything is completely symmetric over here. Um, as you can see here, this is word line. Um, all of the all of the rows are going to get the same word line. OK, so we're going to access many rows in the same way by just driving one uh, line horizontally. And we're going to also stack these bit cells on top of each other, as you can see here on the right. And the bit lines will be connected, will be shorted to each other. Um, uh, vertically. So we're going to have many um, cells in a column on one bit cell. And that way, when we um, we turn on one word line and we pre-charge the bit lines, we're going to have this uh, uh, cross between a bit line and a word line. It's going to be able to choose uh, and access one single cell, which is what gives us our random access, right? Our RAM. Uh, we're going to be able to randomly access a single cell by um, crossing the word line, only one word line is going to be selected a single time, and by um, accessing a single bit line. So that's our basic uh, 60 SRAM cell, which we're going to be now discussing in more detail in the next parts of the lecture. Before we go on, I just want to go over the Computer Hall of Fame. And uh, the Computer Hall of Fame for today is going to be the really cool computer, which is called the Macintosh. It's actually the machine that introduced us to the graphical user interface. It introduced us to the mouse. And it introduced us to the one and only Steve Jobs. Um, actually, the Macintosh didn't invent 
the uh, user interface or the mouse, but it brought it into the mainstream. So this was the Macintosh. This is a it was the uh, real high end uh, personal computer when I was growing up, and um, it was really designed uh, so uh, so easy that people could actually use it. Computers were not very nice before that. They were good for us type of engineers with a command line interface, but a Macintosh brought this uh, idea of Windows that real people could use. I guess you'd call it. Um, it was actually developed based on a three-day tour of Apple at Xero uh, Xerox Park, where they saw the, the Xerox Alto. So Steve Jobs, um, he was a, a, a visionary and a real smart guy, and he asked or he paid quite a bit of money, but uh, nothing in, in the long run to Xerox, to go and take a tour of their, um, of their research center, Park. And um, they, he went there and he saw a, a, a demonstration of the Xerox Alto, which was really a groundbreaking machine that actually showed these things, this uh, graphical user interface, mouse, and other types of things on it. And the um, Xerox Alto was more of a um, kind of an engineering sample a, a demonstrator to show the world what could be done. But um, Steve Jobs realized that this was something that really would be an excellent product and went, went back to Apple and said, OK, you guys design this thing for me. Let's go and sell it. OK, it was introduced in 1984. It sold for a whopping $2,500. It had an 8 megahertz, 8 megahertz Motorola 6800 processor with 128 kilobytes of RAM. Okay, it included uh, such uh, classics as Mac Paint and Mac Write, which were the uh, initial kind of, you know, paint program and the initial uh, word processor, graphical word processor. And it, it sales declined at some point, and they eventually actually fired Steve Jobs from Apple in 1985. He came back, and we all know what happened since then. But one of the things I wanted to show you is one of the um, all-time best commercials that ever came out. Um, Remember, this was introduced in 1984, and uh, during the Super Bowl, this uh, amazing commercial um, was, uh, uh, was shown. Just as a reminder, 1984 was the year of the Olympics in Los Angeles. That was a uh, boycott also from the Soviets. So this was a very, very patriotic, interesting. In 1984, of course, is uh, the book by George Orwell where, as you can see, Big Brother is talking to the crowd. On January 24th, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh. And you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. So, I hope you guys enjoyed that. One of the classic uh, commercials of all time and probably the best Super Bowl commercials of all time.